We have a very um, distinguished industry member with us today. We have Ray Titus, who is the CEO at United Franchise Group. And some of you may not know what UFG uh, is, but UFG, you'll have to correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but is the parent company for Coworks LLC, which is the parent company for Venture, Venture X and now Office Evolution, uh, making you one of the largest operators of co-working spaces uh, globally today. And that's fairly recent that you um, added OE to the portfolio. So thanks for taking the time to do this with us today. Well, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Gio. We appreciate, uh, you know, I appreciate being on. And uh, yeah, we're so excited to uh, continue expanding in, in the co-working industry um, with our uh, recent, uh, you know, acquisition of Office Evolution. Um, that that was a, a great addition to our, our co-works brand and um, Venture X that we already have. So, yeah, and so go ahead, Jamie. Gio and I will fight over this. <laughs> we haven't totally gotten down our like, you go, and then I go, and then you go. That's what makes it fun. Well, yeah. I just wanted to back out and say Gio um, outed me and, and admitted that I was like, this guy's kind of a big deal. Can you just give us like the UFG profile for those that, you know, kind of don't know the the zoom out of of UFG sure. and, and the brands and kind of where, you know, color sure. fits in, and then Gio uh, will get to go. Okay. Well, thank you, Jamie. Um, uh, I grew up in franchising. My dad started Minuteman Press in the 70s, and he taught me franchising. So in 1986, I opened up the first Sinorama store. Uh, I was 23 years old and didn't know any different and just listened to my dad. And he mentored me and gave me the money and we built up uh, Sinorama. Uh, after that, we opened up a second brand called Embroid Me, which has become fully promoted now. We have about um, 300 of those around the world as well, uh, almost 800 Sinorama stores now. Um, and then we really started to expand when we uh, started Transworld, um, Transworld Business Advisors, which is today the world's largest business brokerage. Uh, we have over 6,000 business listings for sale right now in the system. Um, and so that one's really booming as well. Uh, then we started food. We got it and, and built a food division. We have the Great Greek and we have Gray's Craze, which, which is charcuterie boards and boxes. Uh, between the two of those, uh, we have... We have about 25 Great Greeks open and about 30 Grays Crazes open, but we have almost 300 sold between those two brands. And so it is going to be a massive uh, part of our company. And we just introduced uh, the name, kind of like when we have Coworks, we have Big Flavor Brands is the name that we have for our division. Or instead of calling it the food division, we now can call it Big Flavor Brands. And, and then we added uh, Network Lead Exchange, which is a networking franchise. Um, and kind of interesting, it dovetails into our co-working because we have several owners that own Network Lead Exchanges within their Venture X and have done a really nice job. And it really works very well with the brand. Um, and I can get into that in a little bit. Um, we also then got into co-working and uh, that's where we found Venture X and um, developed that franchise and then added Office Evolution this past year and developed Coworks, uh, which is our divisional name for our co-working uh, companies. And we'll look to add others and as we build and grow. Uh, we also have Accurate Franchising which turns people's businesses and ideas into franchises. We do about eight to 10 of those a month that we turn into franchises. And so that's a, a, a big part of our business. Actually, that's how we found Grace Craze uh, from Oklahoma. Uh, and um, I didn't even know they, you know, they had a charcuterie in Oklahoma. And uh, that sounds really bad, but I don't mean that <laughs> bad on anybody from Oklahoma, but um, it, anyway, from my standpoint, we I flew to Oklahoma City and uh, great place, by the way, Cowboy Hall of Fame and, you know, a great city. 
and um, found uh, them uh, the business, and we ended up purchasing that company and, and growing from there. So overall, it's 10 brands, 1,600 franchisees in 80 countries worldwide. And um, the, the, I'm blessed to have three uh, sons that are all in the business, uh, three nephews that are all in the business. And uh, so we're truly, uh, we're, we're a family business. We're a big company, but we're also a family run. Um, the same guy that started it 36 years ago. And uh, um, I tell them that, you know, I'm, I'm here for a, a good a good 10 years longer and uh, they're going to have to put up with me for a lot longer. And uh, we have a great relationship and it, it, it really works. It works. Yeah, I, Ray, one of the things I love about you most is just your your passion, right? And it, it just, you can feel it as we're sitting here having the conversation and when you in, interact with your franchisees, your staff, just people in general. Um, but there's really three things that all kind of play off of that make you great for this industry um, as a whole and the brand you've tried to create is one, your passion about entrepreneurs, right? You're You're big on that. Two, the servant leadership side, right? And to yep. serve and build communities, it's really important. And then the last is certainly this has become more of a, a dynamic here in the last two to three years with, with COVID and everything around that was a personal business life balance, right? But at the same time as serving both. And so I think that's the, the suburban drive, really, the, the co-working and flex workspace is seen as being closer to home. So are those three things what drew you to VentureX when you first came across it? How did you come across that? Where did it all come from? It's kind of funny. It's a funny story. I had an employee. I, first, I wish I could say, I, hey, I'm the founder and I, I figured this whole thing out and mm -hmm. I came up with this idea, but that's not true. That's not what happened. What happened was, is I was just working and I had an employee come in my office and say, Ray, the next time you're over on the West Coast of Florida, you want to check this place out called Venture X. And um, he he went to school over there and he knew these people. And he said, you should check it out. I think you're going to like it. Well, we've been big proponents of co-working. I've been in, had offices in Regis all over the world. We work all over the world. Okay. So we understand it very, very well from the customer side at that time. Right. And so my wife and I, we own a place over in the West Coast of Florida. We love the West Coast. It's quieter and, and you know, beautiful beaches. And so we were going over there one weekend and I remembered what he had said. And so we went to Naples and we stopped into this Venture X. And about 20 minutes into the tour of the space, I turned to my wife and I said, this is going to be our biggest company. And she was like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> you know, um, and what she didn't realize is that I was really looking for a growth industry that didn't have a brand on the top of it. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, when 08, 09 hit, the recession hit, jewelry stores got crushed, but Tiffany's didn't get crushed, mm. right? So they were the brand mm. and I wanted to find a growing industry that we could be that brand. And I knew what the Regis product was like, and I knew what the WeWork product was like and their customer base. And I drank their free beer plenty of times. And, and you know, uh, a funny story, we have somebody in, in, um, in training school right now from the Great Greek, and we met at a WeWork in Manhattan. And in their closing, I had to say, excuse me one second, go outside and tell these guys to stop playing foosball and help them carry the foosball <laughs> Uh, you know, in the middle of the, their closing on a franchise for the Great Greek. And we were laughing about that just today. Um, so it, it, it's it's small world. But um, so we ended up partnering with those folks, turning it into a franchise. And they have a big construction company. They still own the, the VentureX in Naples. They actually tripled the size and have done a fantastic job. But we kind of both always knew we both have big companies and we both always knew that one of us was going to run it. And um, they put an offer in and we took it and we paid them that amount and it, it all worked out great. So, And the interesting part is that's a father-son duo too, right? So also a family operated business. It, it, it is, it, it is. And and so it, it, it made, they have a great business, big construction company. And 
have done real well. They've been angel investors in other businesses and every everything else. So, um, you know, it's it. We've never had a crossword. We've never had any issues. There was no problem. They just they wanted to run it. And in our agreement, we had what's called a shotgun clause, which allowed them to determine how much they wanted to buy it for. And then I had my choice of to sell it for that or to buy it for that. And it's the best clause you can have in an agreement because it basically says we don't need attorneys. We don't need outside forces. We just basically what I did when I got their offer is I went into the boardroom and I invited like 10 different people around the table and said, would you buy it or would you sell it for this amount? And every single one of them said, we should buy it. We should buy it. We should buy it. We should buy it. And that's what we did. Yeah. So I call it uh, I slice, you pick. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's, it's exactly. It's like if you're going to split a, if it's like if you're going to split a steak with somebody or split a, a meal with somebody, that one person can cut it, but the other person has to decide which piece they get, right? Yeah. And so that's kind of the clause, and it really, really worked very well. And we actually have that in all our partnership agreements now. Yeah, it's a great way to keep people honest, right? Because you're like, I can't be too uh, overzealous because I could end up on the wrong side of this thing. Yeah, I mean, if they if they had, you know, overpriced it, like I could have just said, yeah, that's fine, we'll take it, you know, and 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 walked away with it. But we see a a much bigger picture with our co working division and plan and co works and what we're doing here. So I think that. When you see what Marriott's done with Bonvoy, when you start to see what some of these companies are doing out there, that's what we envision more for Coworks. And not that we're going to have, um, you know, a hundred brands and and go from there. But I I really think that having choices in this industry and having differentiators in each of them, like Office Evolution. It was a perfect addition to our brand and our company. And, it, you know, we had our hurdles with the purchase um, as all acquisitions you have. We we own our own acquisition company called Excella Acquisitions. And, you know, you always have challenges when you do these things, but um, it worked out great. And, um, you know, one averages about 12,000 square feet, 10, 10 to 12,000 square feet. One averages 20 to 25,000 square feet. One has two people, one has one person. And, and they're different product, okay? Um, and they're very, very um, usable space. Both of them are really good. One does events, one doesn't do events, you know? So there's a lot of differentiators. I have to, to a two-part question. One is, I'm curious, when you walked into the Venture X, which was probably 5,000 feet at the time? Eight. 8,000. Okay. Yeah. Like what does your like franchise scaling brain, like what did it see? That was my question too. Yeah. Okay. And what, then, what I... and then <laughs> like, what do you see now? You know, you talked about like, how did you go from like 8,000 feet? This is it. But what yeah. does it need to look like to scale? Like, well, we can start there. As soon as I, wa when I walked in, the, the first thing that came to my mind, because I, you know, again, having the experience as the customer, in so many of these other places, having an office in 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 one of them, I won't say what brand. I don't want to you know say anything bad about a brand, but the the office didn't have any windows and there was no glass and it was like being in jail. Okay, so it was like you know not not a good experience. Super inspiring and, uh, workplace. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, those interior offices that you can get for less money that are just uh, anyway. I, I don't want to. I walked in and what I loved was the first thing I loved was the vibe. They had a entrepreneurial, they had quotes up on the wall from entrepreneurs. They had pictures. Um, I knew, uh, I didn't even see the numbers and I knew it had to be double the size to be profitable or to make any kind of money in this. Like, I don't know how they landed on 8,000 square feet, but it, you know, again, I think that was part of the flaw of that part. And they figured it out. They're at 24,000 square feet now. Okay. So, um, but they start, they had to start somewhere and, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And and they did it and they made it. Um, but I could also see you couldn't make a lot of money in that kind of model, the way that was designed. Um, also, I didn't think their conference rooms were big enough. I, I, I just kind of felt like we just needed to be bigger. And I didn't know the number was going to be 25,000 square feet and that we'd have spaces that are 45,000 square feet right now. Okay. But 
I, I knew it needed to be bigger. Um, I, I love the glass. I love the openness, the light, the, I mean, I sound like a customer, you know, <laughs> yep. and that's what I am. And, and so having that customer experience was really what it was all about. Um, but I, from day one, I always felt like it needed to be much bigger than that. And, and, um, and bolder, uh, what I, what I envisioned and, and, um, you know, when we went and had, um, had this laid out and done, uh, and, and Gensler, uh, did it, the first run of it. Um, we wanted a big front entryway, like an area that when big companies would be impressed, it, you walk in, not a small waiting room, not two chairs, not like, you know, we wanted something where like this was impressive for everybody to walk in. My whole thing was I want people to walk in and go, wow, like this is, you know, because that's what you want them to say to the people that are in that space. So mm -hmm. if the customers are saying that to, you know, the, the, our, our members, they're hearing that from them and they're, it's reinforcing why they're at the Venture X and that it's impressive and that they should stay. Um, and then having the events and, and everything right there where people could walk in made a lot of sense as well. So it, it kind of served two purposes. It was the wow factor of walking in, but then it was the events that we, we did right from the start. So. So here's an interesting one. So if you could change anything that you guys did from that acquisition, how you built the company, what would it be? The first acquisition or the second acquisition? The first one. The first one. If I could change anything, I would have had a different brand leader. That would have been the, the guy that we had running. It was a really nice guy, um, but he was just a really nice guy. He was yeah. not... Uh, he was soft, you know, and you kind of know this business. If you're dealing with these high end landlords and um, the people that high end customers and high end, you know, every one of our franchise owners are type A and and demanding. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I had to step in so many times and get involved in so many different little things that I shouldn't have been. And um, but that that's probably would have been the first thing. I still would have done the deal. I still would have done the partnership. I still would have done everything else. Um, and I didn't want to pay that bill from Gensler because it was so expensive. But um, <laughs> it, but my but the partner at the time was right. He, he I mean, it was a big bill. OK, it was a six figure bill. And I'm like, you know, I don't need somebody else to tell me where to put the couches. And but I I, I was thinking too small and he was right and I, I was thankful for that looking back on it um you know that was the right decision yeah no uh so kind of play off your uh what you would change I'll tell you that was part of my struggle at the beginning as y'all were trying to grow was in my interaction it was y'all were still trying to figure out the brand right so it's like okay so what am who am I rep I'm big on whoever I represent speaks of me right yeah. so it was like Am I representing the right clients? Because we have a name to uphold too, right? Jamie and I do and, and other people yep. as well. And so, you know, to your credit um, and your team's credit, over the last several years, you've really built an incredible team. You've brought in people that have industry experience, people within your team, you know, like Jason and Michael White and Kaza, I think you didn't even bring over as part of this. He was your real estate guy and he's become your your co-working guy. So it's been really awesome to see you kind of build that team and, and, and kudos to you for seeing that. And I mean, it, it says a lot about uh, your overall ability to lead a team, to be able to look back and go, Hey, you know what? We, we, we picked the wrong skipper to start. Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, it, it's funny. We do really, really well. And you learn what you do well and what you do wrong, right? Like, so I could share with you, like, I remember early stages of Embroid Me, they were like, well, we got 100 locations, right? If we just bring in our own polo shirts, you know, we could double the price and, you know, the whole this thing. So yeah, okay, that sounds great. You know, and, and the next thing you know, 
We got, um, you know, those boats that were on strike at the L.A. docks. Uh, I, I had, uh, you know, half a million dollars in shirts sitting in those boats and and I can't get. And then they got holes in them and they're from Bangladesh. And I, you know, you can't I still send have, them back. <laughs> uh, I still have those shirts, uh, you know, in my warehouse here, you know, 20 years later. So um, it, it's not it wasn't a good deal. So anytime we get outside of our real lane, we we don't do well. And so. When I looked at this, we do better when we promote from within. Like when I, you know, like you said, Matt, Matt Kaza, okay, Matt knows how to get things done with us, you know, and, and it's so important. But when you have a brand leader from the outside coming into UFG, man, they not only have to learn the new industry and the company, they got to learn UFG. And that's yeah. hard. That's not... That's not an easy, we're not easy. And and I and I know that. So, you know, and and so it's good to get people from within and grow with them. Um, and and I, I you'll see more of that too, because I've got three sons and three nephew nephews coming along. So that you'll see more of that too. But not only them, but others as well. Yeah, and I think that speaks highly to another point that I know that's big for you that I've heard you say before, but um the try your hardest every day right and be the best that you can be right so I, I i talked to enough of your team and interact with enough of them to know that you've got high expectations um yep. but again I, I share that with people all the time i'm like if you think i have high expectations of you imagine what i have of myself right so <laughs> that's right you're passing that along um so i think that's that's huge that you look at your internal team because you know how they work and where they fit into the system yep. Yeah. And Gio, you can, I mean, you're hundred percent right. I mean, we believe in setting high goals, any good coach, any good teacher, any good, you know, any good parent always wants more for their student or their kid or anything else than most of them even think they can get out of it. Right. Yeah. And so um, any great coach I ever had, you know, I played basketball, but any great coach I ever had always thought we could do better than the team actually thought we could do. And, and so uh, that's how, you know, I, I've kind of taken that in sports and applied that in my business life. And it, it it really makes a difference when you do hit those things and those people see that. Holy cow. It, you know, you talk about breaking through the glass ceiling that when you start setting high goals and you start getting people to realize some of those high goals. OK, instead of just saying, yeah, we could do 20% better. And like, what is, what would it look like if you did 50% better? Tell me what we'd have to do different to hit 50%. Because I think you're going to do 10% out of just attrition and it's just going to happen. And then you'll work to get another 10%. But then what are you going to do from halftime to the end of the year after you hit that? Like, what are we talking about? Why set low goals and hit them? why not set really, really high goals and strive for them and push it? And so a, a long time ago, I, I came up with this saying is that it's okay to be unrealistic as long as you know it. And so- it, I, it, I love that quote. I was just doing some 2023 planning and you know I listened to a lot of like audio books and entrepreneurs are like so optimistic and so <laughs> it's, so it's hard to know right like I'm talking to myself in my head I'm like okay is this like really unrealistic or you know really too yeah over optimistic or um yeah you just have to like be a little self-aware like you know where you're going with that so I love it I, I remember one of our franchise owners who was a big five accountant and and owned a Sinorama and great guy and and really really pragmatic and and he said I don't understand your your quote and I said it's okay <laughs> to be unrealistic as long as you know it so so if I know I'm being uh, like if I'm telling you you can do you know three million when you're only at one million um you know I know I'm being unrealistic but I know I'm being unrealistic but I believe in you and I want to set a higher yeah goal for you and you so believe if you if you just go for that bigger number you're gonna get something in between you know if you don't yeah. if you don't know you're being unrealistic then you're delusional right and so that that's the you know kind of the definition of a delusional so I know there's times where I'm unreasonable, 
and I know it, but mm -hmm. I'm doing it on purpose and, you know, it, it drives the business and that's what it's all about. So everybody knows that in our place that our, our minds and hearts are in the right direction. So like, we're all about improvement. We're all about what's right for the company and what's right for the individuals both. And so if I'm asking somebody to do something, they don't, they don't have to question, you know, the intention or, you know, because I'll do it, you know, like they'll know, Hey, you know, if, if Ray said that, that's what we're doing. Like, that's it. Or if HA said that, that's what we're doing or Brady or Jason or, our leaders that we have, and we have great, great leaders. Um, but it's it's been awesome to see the synergy between VentureX and Office Evolution. Well, and, so let's let's go part B of my question. So, yeah, what's next? Like, what what's the vision for the the Bonvoy strategy? How how do you think that'll play out? Or what are you you know what's what's the goal? There, there, we don't like, we don't have a set like, Hey, this is how many brands we want to have. We don't have a set. This is a, I, you know, I've spoken to a couple of large uh, companies out of the country. Um, I think that there's, there's, um, there's an interesting dynamic that if we could get a, a you know, a brand that fits I, I, again, differentiators with office evolution and venture X, but that's already established, that's already successful in another country, and we could bring that brand into America. Mm -hmm. um, that's an interesting play. Uh, we are going to sell master licenses for our brands. We've already been doing that. We're in Spain, we're in Costa Rica, we're in India, we're in England. We're, we have multiple locations in, in all of those uh, countries, in Canada. Uh, we'll be opening up a VentureX in Australia. Um, and moving our headquarters into it, I'll be selling our current facility and moving our headquarters out of AventureX in Sydney. Uh, that'll happen in 2023. Uh, it's already been, you know, looked at and going forward with that. So we're excited about that. Um, and we've got other countries. We have, I would tell you, we have about seven countries that have put deposits down or close to closing um, in the first quarter for VentureX. So international really is coming on strong. Office Evolutions in 25 states and no international. So uh, when we looked at Office Evolution, we saw a couple things right away. And then when we looked for them, we, our, one of our big strengths is franchise sales. It was one of their biggest weaknesses. Mm -hmm. um, they had nothing in international. We're in 80 countries. OK, so those kind of things, you know, it, it's it, it's great. It, you know, when we did the acquisition, it was funny because I, I had a meeting with one of their their top people and he told me, boy, it'd be great if we could find some candidates like you guys have that have millions of dollars to open up office evolutions. But we can't find those people. Well, during due diligence, we did a <laughs> we did a search in there in, in right in their own system. They had somebody that we had a deposit from for a franchise in their system, but they never called the person. So at that point, you know, most people would say, "Oh, that's not good." No, that's the best news I ever got. Right, right, right. For you, I yeah. was like. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Let's go. Right. Let's get this deal done. And we're going to call those guys. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we, we got, we got a database and that's the other thing to utilize the database of both companies to cross sell the different brands. Um, this, this year we're, we're introducing the hub and spoke uh, between uh, venture X and office evolution. And that's where you'd have an, uh, you know, one venture X and you'd surround it in different suburbs with, three or four office evolutions. Uh, we're doing that right now in two cities. And um, that I believe is going to be somewhat of a game changer because, you know, there'll be feeder programs. We have waiting lists in many of our venture axes and office evolutions right now. And working together, we've got more single offices over at the office evolution. We've got bigger offices over at venture X we have events over at VentureX. We have we don't have that over at Office Evolution, so they can play off of each other really, really well. Yeah, and I'll say, kind of, kind of stepping back on a couple of things you said is, 
you know, I had the pleasure of working with the OE team before the acquisition, and I was kind of straddling both sides during that. So it was certainly interesting. Uh, as you well know, I knew things I probably shouldn't have known. And <laughs> oh, I, re- and- I remember that all too well. <laughs> I mean, I was in I was in Ireland, I think. When I when I when I was like it, it, we were at a delicate time and I was like Geo, what is Geo doing? What you know what is? And Jason was like, Oh, I got it, I got it. There was no problem. There was nothing. Yeah, no, but I mean, I think one of the most important parts and where I was heading with that was, I mean, Office Evolution was a co-working company. They start off with corporate-owned stores that tried to become a franchise or right. That's yeah. the difference. And I've heard you say this, and other people have told me you say this is. You you very much recognize that you're a franchise sales company that has gotten in the co-working business, right? And I think yeah, that's ab- huge. A- absolutely, Gio. I'll take you to our first meeting, okay? After the purchase, we did the acquisition on Friday afternoon. It was done. I was uh, Monday morning in Denver for the first staff meeting with the whole crew, okay? And it was me and one accountant from UFG, all the rest were Office Evolution employees. And they're all nervous. They don't know what's going to happen. They think, uh, you know, this is like Gordon Gecko's coming in to, you know, wipe out our world. And um, (laughs) part of that was true, but it it didn't happen the same way that that they thought. (laughs) Not that day. (laughs) Not that day, right? But, But here's what happened, okay? I sat and I said, I got first question I have for the group. Okay, and I'm going to have a lot of questions. But the first question is, what business are we in? First person, what business are we in? Co-working, co-working, co-working. co-working. Every single person mm-hmm. in their staff said co-working. My accountant said, we're in franchising. And then I looked at them all and I said, you guys, your franchise owners are in co-working. You're the franchise company that mm-hmm. services them. If I said, if you're in co-working, take me around, show me your office that you're renting out. Show me, show me the co-working business that you're, because that's not what our business is. That's the industry we're in, but that's, we're a franchise company that's in co-working and we have the service. We have, our mission statement is we have one customer, our franchisee, when they're successful, we're successful. And that's it. So you have one customer, it's the franchise owner, the franchise owner is in the co-working industry, they have got all those customers, all those members. Mm -hmm. So they had to get it. And and Geo, that's right on target because they had to understand it and they didn't. And I I, look, I think there were a lot of things there that kind of the people with the money behind it didn't have any co-working experience and didn't have any franchise experience, neither one. And so there were some things that were missing and we were able to identify those things and and move on. Um, they had eight company stores. They now we now have one company store. Uh, we're down to one, and we'll get that one sold as well. We don't have any company locations. We don't believe in them. Not your business. Not our business. Okay. We don't. It, if if you said to me, and, and I said this to them, I said if if I was getting a hundred percent of the profit from one location and 6% of the profit from another location, where would I spend more of my time? I mean, yeah. that's what happened with them. I said, I don't want any of it. Uh, I, I didn't want, I didn't want that. I want all the time on the franchisees. I want us to focus on the franchisees success, not on of my company stores. I'm not going to, doesn't make sense. Now I had in the beginning, you got to prove the model and, you, you know, it makes sense in the beginning, but, you know, not, it doesn't make sense down the road. Ray, when you attract franchisees um, into your portfolio, are are they coming in because they want food or they want embroidery me or they want co-working or do they want to operate a franchise and they're trying to figure out which one? I, I say yes. It, it's, okay. it's, it's all the above. We, we do have... I would say there's more people that come through organic leads and and come through search engines and everything else that we do because they're interested in real estate or they're interested in co-working or they're interested in signs or they're interested in a specific business. Mm. Um, so we do get more that way. Okay. 
Um, but there are people that come in and say, look, I, I want to invest this amount of money. I want to, you know, look for this type of return. What should we get into? What, you know, and they come in, it's more of a consultative sale. And in those cases, you kind of got to eliminate, kind of like doctors do. They eliminate what it isn't. And then they figure out what what it is at the end. And that's kind of what we do with the brands. But, you know, if somebody has never been in food, it's not a good idea to start now. OK, and like if you're not a food person, the chances of you becoming a food person in running a restaurant is not good. OK, although so, the charcuterie boxes sound pretty approachable. I'm going to do the charcuterie business. Geo should do an embroidery business. I, I, you know, I stop paying your friend. You should have your own. There you go. There you go. We could <laughs> we could sell two franchises here. But, See, done. We're doing deals. We're doing yeah, well. Charcuterie <laughs> board is different, and let me tell you why. It's more like edible arrangements. Right. It's more totally. of a delivery business. Yeah. It doesn't have a hood. There's no grill. Right. There's. I'm none not of that. managing like inventory and waste. There's no and waiters, just, waitresses. Yeah. There's none yeah. of that, and so it it's. I would tell you that the Grace Craze is closer to the Sinorama model yeah. than it is a food business. Even I'm though it's it down, just so you even, know. Even it is food. We need but. we need one in Burlingame. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> we totally do. Okay, so does the Bonvoy model grow through acquisition? Like, are you, you talked about sort of OUS brands coming in? Are there yeah. so is mostly acquisition or bringing existing brands to the U.S.? I think it's both. It's it like we're in talks right now with probably five different okay. brands. I've got a couple big ones. Uh, you know, uh, I think, you know, if we're able to establish, uh, you know, one more uh, good size one, I think the the PR and um, the co-working industry will really, uh, they took notice of the office evolution purchase for sure. Okay. And then now we've become one of the larger players now with the locations that we have. But we do another one that differentiates and maybe one more, two more, you know, something like that. Then I think you're going to see a, a different a different path that's going to kind of open up. I, I, I know the competitors very well. As I've said, I know them really well. They don't know franchising very well. They, they're not good at franchising. Um, they're good at telling people what to do. They don't know how to handle a franchisee that's a millionaire that um, <laughs> trying to work that. And and so, you know, they've got their positives and their good things. And they've got, you know, certainly they've got money and everything else. But I had a funny thing that, you know, that recently um, we had a franchise owner. This was a couple of years ago in, in, uh, in Adventure X. And I went to visit his space and he had took the nicest office for himself hmm. now like i don't know what your pet peeve is like i like when i fly my pet peeve is somebody behind me that lifts themselves up by pulling my seat okay yeah. that is like one of my pet peeves because i fly a lot right and so um anyway one of my business pet peeves for venture x is the franchise owner that takes one of the best you know it's like taking the parking spot in the front of the building that's for the customers it's not for you like wake up and 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 so he had the nicest office in it and i was like are you kidding me like what did you why would you take the office that you can monetize and you know it's just insane right and so i knew we ended up reselling that space and and the new owner in there has done very very well um but that's because the previous owner was more interested in having his tv and the you know and and everything and he didn't buy it for the right reasons but I went to visit one of the competitors and their corporate headquarters is one of the nicest spots that you could have. And, and so I was like, man, it's pretty much the same thing. Like, why would you have your <laughs> corporate office in the nicest spot? Like, that's the one you should rent out. That's the one you should lease out. What are they doing? And, you know, I don't know. Like Jason says, Ray, we must be doing it wrong. We're profitable. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> so i'm going to switch gears a little bit on another one that's important to you is mentorship right oh and yeah you've got uh like you said you've got three sons in the business you've got two uh nephews that are like sons right it's, it's been very uh uh heartwarming to hear some of those stories as i interact with your 
with your team. Uh, so what, what about how difficult is it to mentor your children? Um, now it's not hard at all, but it, and <laughs> for, it, it took a while to get to that point, but, um, I think, you know, the key geo is put the, you know, I, when my wife and I had our first child, we went to a seminar, um, and it was a guy named Josh McDowell. He's an author. And, um, we saw him speak and he said something we never forgot. He said that kids spell love T I M E. And that's it. And if you get anything out of this, just take that. And I looked at my wife and I said, you know, we were nervous. We we're like, like we're new parents and, you know, our parents were both in both sides were great, but not, you know, today's parents, they were old school and different. And I turned to my wife and I said, I, I, I can do this now. Like I, I got this, like, I know what I got to do. And, and that's make it the priority and put the time in. Why, why do family businesses fail? Because they don't plan and they don't put the time in and they don't train the people to take the next step and, and to pass it on the right way. It, it's not in their blood. It's got to be, you know, you got to put the time and effort into them. And so um, mentoring, meeting to this day, I mean, really only, um, let me just think, only two of them of the six that family members, only two of them report to me in the in our business structure. Out of that, but every one of them has a monthly meeting with me. And we and I go over 12 specific subjects, one each month. And I outline that for the whole year. And we go over how they're doing, what are they doing, what are their goals, where they, you know, what do they want to do, where they, you know, and then I have somebody else from our board that meets with them multiple times a year as well. So we're we spend time mentoring, we spend time coaching, um, and and I we also invest in them. One of them got his MBA, AJ got his MBA. Another one, I mean, it, 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 they are the CFE, you know, credits and everything else that we do. And it's not just investing in them; it's all the employees, you know, all our leaders. We, I mean, you've got to invest in your people. And it's, it's today, it's a, a big thing. You don't want to lose your best people, right? You, so you need to invest in them. Ray, you keep talking about your sons and nephews, but behind you, I see one photo and it's of a fluffy white dog. <laughs> that, that is, I'll share it with you. Okay. So that's Lily. Okay. So this is, this is, this is Lily. Okay. Is Lily and, a mini golden doodle? Lily is a English cream golden doodle English and cream. she is a, just a gorgeous dog. She's about 40 pounds. She was my Christmas present um, three years ago. And that dog is like amazing. <laughs> like she can, she's, you know, she's part of the business and the family too. Oh, and no, she's not allowed in the business. It, we don't <laughs> let any dogs in. Because if I let her in the business, then everybody would have their dogs here and, you know, we couldn't do that. But she is, no, she's really, really special dog. <laughs> it sounds so stupid. I mean, we've had dogs our whole time and, 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 you know, they've been great dogs. We had golden retrievers and, great dogs and and at most times we had two dogs we had a little dog and we had a big dog um but this dog and i don't know whether because we're older now and maybe i don't know what it is but this dog like is so smart and so, such a good dog and like on weekends the dog knows it's a weekend and the dog knows like I'm coming with you wherever you're going. Like she won't let us leave the house. Like you can't get out of the house without her coming. She's coming. And so it's just really funny. I like, we're going for breakfast and the dog, well, now we got to go to a different place because they don't have any outside seating. <laughs> so, yeah. But the dog, we're dog lovers. So I have two mini golden doodles and we lost one a couple of years ago. And I felt the same way. I was like, this dog is the perfect dog. And I love my other dog, but this one. So somebody told me that you get like one heart dog, like that dog that just is like yep. super in tune with you and maybe you only get one, you know? I don't know. I, I yeah. don't know. Somebody told me also, Jamie, that if you think of the dog you had when you were little, 
its name is probably <laughs> <laughs> this is bad they said that, it, that if you take your if you take the street you grew up on and your dog's name it's a stripper's name <laughs> and i went what are you talking about and they and i said wait a second mine would be tip tippy sugar uh, and i was like oh my god <laughs> Ooh, that's good. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Oh, I see. <laughs> like, this is ridiculous. And I never, I was like, oh my gosh. So I don't know if that holds true all the time, but my dog's name is Lily. So <laughs> I don't know. But, that, that's uh, awesome. Um, so I don't want your, your children to get uh, jealous of Lily. So if you were to take AJ, Andrew, and Austin and come up with one word for each of them, what would they be? You pick whatever order you want. Wow. Um, I'd say um, Austin is is uh, fun. That would that's the word that he's very engaging and fun. And um, I'd say with Andrew, he's driven. He's driven. And um, with AJ, I would say uh aj's caring he's he cares he cares about the people he cares about the franchise he's just he's a really really caring he's got a new daughter and um it's you know it is like he's like an aj's like an old man in a young you know he's 30 years old but it's like my wife always said like that kid is more mature than you and and so and, and I'd be like, uh -oh. I don't care, you know, like, <laughs> but he is, he, you know, he's like he's like an old man in in a 30 year old body. But he he gets that, I think, from my father in law who um, uh, passed. He was with us for 20 years in the business as well. So I worked with my father in law and for 20 years. And it was my my dad and my older brother told me it was the biggest mistake I was ever going to make in business was hiring my father in law. And I did it anyway. And they could not understand it. They were like, you're out of your mind. And hmm. it was one of the best moves I ever made because I could travel and get on the road and do what I had to do. And he was here and he was in the office and he was the adult in the room that I needed. And he was great. He, he was great. And so uh, AJ got a lot of that. He's He's wise and he's caring. So he got that. And so, but they're, they, they all have multiple things, but Gio, you made me just say one word, right? So. It, yeah. And so much of, of your belief system and so many of the things that, that really drive you and your team and that you instill in others is, is based around your faith. Right. And yeah. so I know that's a big part of it. You want to share yeah. that a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things that everybody here knows. They know I'm a Christian, and uh, I don't. You know, it's not my job to preach to people. I I do it out of example, and I do reach out in, in sometimes in my books, or that I, I I read forty to fifty books a year, and I write one book a year. Uh, I've been doing that for seven consecutive years now, um, and so. I've got them on um, at raytitus.com on um, Amazon. And, and so, yeah, my Christian faith has been a journey. I started out as a Catholic and, uh, you know, that was, it was okay to have some beers with the priests. And uh, as we played lotto tickets or whatever at the, you know, St. Rocco's feast and, and, uh, but it was a different era and a different time and when we moved to florida my wife and i got married in a catholic church in new york but when we came to florida um the the priests were all from south america here in florida i couldn't understand and it just it wasn't a good fit for us and i didn't want to raise my kids in the catholic church and so we found um first baptist in downtown west palm beach and it's turned into family church and we have 11 campuses now. It is an awesome church with a pastor that's raised eight kids. And uh, it's just amazing people. And um, I know I wouldn't be the person I am today if it wasn't for my pastor, my church, my faith. Um, and we, our whole family got baptized together in the ocean 
um, as a, as a family and, uh, which was pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's it. one of those things that, uh, look, I could tell you that it's, it's made such a difference in my business life. And, you know, there's a lot of people that don't go to church or don't have that part in their life. And I will tell you, they'll put four hours into a football game, but they won't give God an hour. And it makes no sense at all. And, and you take a step back and you go, my goodness, this is just, uh, you know, you're around good people. They're pouring good things into you. And if you can't take a couple great things away each week, then you weren't listening um, or you're or you're at the wrong church. And and but it, it's helped me tremendously. And and through tough times, you know, losing my parents and, you know, layoffs in the business or over years and things like that, you know, the that, you know, I remember one time, Gio, I, I was in um, I was driving from Las Vegas to L.A. And we were, we had business in Vegas and then we had to be in L.A. And, and the times for the flights, you know, like we ended up just take the rent a car. Let's just go. And we did. And in the drive, my phone rings and it was my pastor and he's called and he just said, Hey, Ray, I was just thinking about you. And I just wanted to see if everything's okay. How are you doing? And I said, I'm doing great. I, I just, I really, I really appreciate the call. And he'll do that from time to time, you know, just check in and, and, and make sure everything's okay. And is there anything I can pray about for you? And that was it. And we hung up and the guy I was driving with turn, turned to me and said, boy, I wish I could find a pastor that would call me. I said, well, come to my church, you know, <laughs> he'll call you. Doors open. Yeah. <laughs> and then we can, you just go, you know, and it, it was like, you know, I guess I could. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And so, I mean, it, I, I, I took somebody to church one, my uh, family member, not my immediate family, but family member. And, um, she said after it, I didn't like when he said this. And I said, well, he spoke for 45 minutes. Hmm. You know, if you only got one sentence that you didn't like, then he did pretty good. I mean, because I know if I got up there for 45 minutes, it'd probably be five or six things you didn't like that I said. OK, but if he only had that one thing, that's pretty good. But everybody seems to focus on the on the thing they disagree with instead of just focusing on the stuff you do agree with and just, you know, but I wish that was politics too, but that'll never happen. Uh, you know, like if we could just focus on the stuff we agree on and get some stuff done, that would be good. Uh, you know, let's start with that and, uh, and not worry about all the stuff we don't agree on. And I think that's what I love most about what we get to do on a daily basis in our, in our business and in community and everything else is it doesn't have to be a pastor. Right. And that's no. what people in, in these, uh co-working and flex centers and everything get to do they 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 can tell they interact with the licensees members whatever clients whatever you want to call them on a daily basis they can tell when someone's having a bad day right and they get to yeah. choose whether they want to reach out and pour into them or not oh, but that's so. that's such a good point i mean that's what the community part of our business is all about it's 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 you know can you get your best customer in the space can you get your best vendor in the space can you get your best i mean how do you create stickiness for the people that want to stay and stay involved and engage? You got to lead it. I mean, you got to have speakers come in. You got to have musicians come in. You got to have a good time. You've got to have, I mean, there's got to be a, a, you know, a value add that you bring. And I, I think Gio, you're hitting on the, the, the biggest point, which is that community and friendships and, you know, what you bring to each other, you know, the community, that people were lacking because of the pandemic. I mean, they don't want to do the commute, but they also, they want to have somebody to actually talk to that's not a screen, okay? And so that's where, you know, I, I tell you across the board, our occupancy rates are all up. It's incredible to see the growth in the locations. And I mean, the team, you know, I, you, we're talking about setting high goals and before and, and everything else, and they try to temper me because, They'll they'll see I'll see the growth that we had, you know, in 2022. And I'm saying, OK, that's awesome. Now we can just they'll be like, right, right. But they're almost almost sold out in this one and that one. And no, no, no. But we're going to open up more new ones. And so we can do even better and, and virtual memberships and conference room rentals and events. And there's just so many other revenue sources 
that get overlooked when people consider co-working, right? Yep, without a doubt. Jamie, you want to land the plane here? Yeah, we uh we've kept Ray <clears throat> Ray, I'm to we can do a separate episode on, you know, how do you co compartmentalize like your business is growing growth businesses. So your your brain's got to be I can only imagine like what a car ride looks for you looks like <laughs> for you and and where where that brain goes at any any given moment. Um okay, we talked about a lot of kind of exciting opportunities. What's uh what's one thing that keeps you up at night? Um I I wouldn't say there's anything that keeps me up. I've never lost a night's sleep in 36 years because when I'm home I'm home. And I want to be in the moment that I'm in and, and, but uh, believe me, there's things where I wake up and I'm taking a shower and I'm going, Oh man, I got to hit that. I got to do this. You know, and that's when it starts going. Right. And so, um, but look, I, I think that people need to recognize that franchising is one of the greatest business models that has ever been introduced to, to humans. Like there has never been a more, a better, scenario for people to own and manage and run a big business that allows them the support, the training, the know-how, the R&D and everything they get. So they get the opportunity to build and grow and manage their own business, but they get all the benefits that a big business would give them. So it, it has taken more people out of poverty and, and made more people successful and done so much for so many people but for some reason, some of our politicians and some of our states don't recognize it that way. And it, it does get under attack sometimes. Like in California, they threw franchising in with the Uber drivers when they created a bill to go after, uh, you know, these people. It's just insane what they they don't get it. And, and so I can tell you that um, it's that's the part. It doesn't keep me up at night, but that's the part that's frustrating that why isn't the success, if it represents, my goodness, almost 50% of retail sales in the United States is through a franchise. And and if they don't see half the economy come, like they don't get it, like th that is just mind blowing to me that, you know, they wouldn't even understand that. So if, if I was to say that, uh, you know, I'd love for our, our politicians on both uh, the Democrats and the Republicans to really recognize the importance of, I mean, franchising generates more tax money than big business. Franchising generates more jobs than big business. So when you start to look at this, you go, my good, what are they? The other countries are drooling over our economy, which is the number one economy in the world. But what is it that makes up our economy and, and you start to look at this, it's not, you know, everyone, Amazon started out as a small business. Microsoft started out as, a, you know, a, HP, all of these garage stories that started as small business. I mean, you start to look at this and you go, okay, how do you want to create a bigger economy and a better economy? You, you embrace franchising, you embrace entrepreneurship and you allow, you fund it, you help it, you grow it, you don't put more regulations and discourage it. So there's a there's a law in, in, that passed in California that franchisors are responsible for the franchisees employees. Think mm -hmm. about this. I I didn't hire them. I've never met them. They have an agreement with me, assigned the franchise agreement and the state of California is going to ignore the agreement and say that their employee is my employee. Uh, because they want it because they want to go after Uber for the Uber drivers, which makes I can understand they yeah, want the Uber drivers yeah. to get the benefits. They want the Uber drivers to get the insurance. They want the Uber drivers to be treated like employees, but they lump franchises in there. And and when you did that, they they missed the complete boat. They missed everything because now you've got, I mean, think about it. What is a Sinorama owner? In California, what do I have to do with their employee? I don't manage them. I never hired them. I don't pay them. How is he my employee if I don't pay him? And and at the end of the day, I think that thing's going to go to the Supreme Court. 
And yeah, it, it's not logical. I it, hear you. It doesn't make sense. So if you ask me, what's the thing that gets me? You can tell by my soapbox <laughs> here. We got it. Here. Yeah. <laughs> You hit you hit the nerve. It's when these politicians and states they're looking for revenue money, but they're doing it the wrong way. If they would just um, enhance the opportunities to have more franchises, they'll pay more taxes. We pay more. We'll hire more people. Yeah, exactly. And, and so yeah, they don't they they don't look at it that way. They need to invest in something to get the return on investment, not take from it and regulate it. So regulations laws politicians all that kind of stuff is is a big is a big thing it's your goat ray thank you for doing this obviously you have a, a lot of things that demand your time including your adorable dog <laughs> um, so we appreciate you doing this and Thanks. giving us some insight on your story and kind of what you see next for um for uh venture x and oe and and the umbrella company so thanks for doing this well, thank you, Jamie. Very nice spending time with you and Gio. Thank you. I, I really appreciate both of you and the leadership that you provide in co-working in, in the industry. Um, you guys are two of the best. And so I appreciate spending time with both of you. So thanks. I've really enjoyed it. You guys have a great day. Absolutely. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.